Recording. All right. Good morning, everyone. Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, okay. So we're nearing the end of this chapter. Morning, Alex. Um, so basically, the last two classes, we reached the conclusion that if you have a polynomial over the integers and it factors, then it factors over the rationals then you don't need fractions to factor it actually. You need, um, you you only need whole numbers. So for example, the last thing I did on Friday was I, I took a degree four polynomial and I showed it's reducible by just, well, showing that it has no roots, which means he has no degree one factors. And to show that it has no degree two factors, I just wrote out two degree two polynomials with unknowns as the coefficients. and multiply it together and set up a bunch of equations and that would give you um if that was over the rationals that would give you three coefficients uh so three equations three equations and four norms anyway a lot of equations you know a lot of unknowns but if you know that the the solutions are integers, for example, that, that makes things a lot easier. For example, you see that two things multiply to one. Well, over the, over the rational, there's a lot of solutions over the integers, not so many. Um, so, so this is very useful. And, and today I'm gonna apply the same idea to prove Eisenstein's criterion. Uh, Eisenstein? I don't, I think in America people say Eisenstein. Um, so this is the criterion. It tells you when a polynomial is reducible. Uh, we have a polynomial over the integers. And we have a prime. Um, So if a lot of things happen, if P doesn't divide the leading coefficient, P divides A naught, P divides A1, P divides all of the, all of the rest of the coefficients, except for the, the leading one. And P squared doesn't divide A naught, so A naught just has one factor of P in there. Um, then F of X is irreducible. Of course, by what I what I've been saying the whole week. If you're reducible over Q, you're reducible over Z. That's uh, that's obvious, and vice versa, which is not obvious. <clears throat> okay, so um, well, like we are supposed to prove this, but maybe maybe before proving it, um, let's just. I mean, so this is so easy to use. You just Stare at a polynomial. Uh, you you look for a prime that satisfies this, and and if you find one, then you're done. So x to the six minus two is reducible, and I I I can do this in my head. Uh, take the prime two. Two. Oh. Two doesn't divide the leading coefficient, which is one. Uh, two divides all the other coefficients because they're all zero, except for the last one, which is two. And, and finally, two squared, which is four, doesn't divide the, the constant coefficient 
Um, and this is And that's it. <clears throat> so there's a lot of complicated polynomials, which, which um, if you use size and size criteria, you just take one look at them and you can tell that they're reducible without, you know, starting to write equations. Um, for example, you take just just really whatever. Um, <clears throat> what is why is this irreducible? The prime number three does not divide two, but it divides 12, 9, 27, 15. The prime number three, uh, exactly. Um, take the prime three, um, three doesn't divide two. 3 divides 12, 9, 27, 15. 9 does not divide 15. What are we done? Um, all right. Um, amazing, that's the point. So, um, so, okay. So, Eisenstein criterion, the thing is, most polynomials, you're not going to be so lucky that they satisfy that you can just apply this. And of course, the, the converse is false. Um, so maybe, OK, so let me ask you this. What's a polynomial that doesn't satisfy Eisenstein criterion and has degree more than one. And, and it's still irreducible. X cubed plus X plus one. X cubed plus X plus one. Um, well, I don't, I don't know in my head if this is reducible. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, that's a good example. Okay, you had a bonus point. Um, so, of course, there's no prime dividing all the coefficients. Uh, because there's one, there's a one, there's still ones there. And why is it irreducible? Come just in time for me to turn the page. Why is this irreducible? You can't factor it into two polynomials. Okay, how do you know that? Because it's cubic. Okay, well, there, there's lots of cubics that I can factor, but like, this is a cubic that I can factor into reducibles, into smaller things.
so if you were going to factor it, what, what would the degrees be of the factors? Two and one. Two and one. So how do you tell that it doesn't have a factor of degree one? What happens when a polynomial has a factor of degree one? So a factor of degree one necessarily it's gonna look like this. Also, actually, if you use the rational zeros test, you can realize that the roots have to be plus and minus one and neither of those are roots. So it's a root is Right, exactly. So. First of all, if he had a factor of the V1, he would have to have a root. He has no roots. And since it's monic, the roots are, are integers. Of course, roots means rational roots. And they divide uh, one. And I can see that one, one is not a root and negative one is not a root. What, what am I doing? So the divisors of one, <clears throat> very easy to forget the negative numbers. So try not to, um, but I mean, x cubed plus x plus one is always hot. So uh, again, without figuring out the signs, one and negative one cannot be roots. So it has no roots. That means the no polynomial of degree one divides it. And if, since it's degree three, if no polynomial of degree one is going to divide it, then nothing can divide it because if you had a degree two polynomial, the other factor would have degree one either way. So it's not irreducible, but it's not because of Eisenstein's criterion. Um, so in practice, Eisenstein's criterion doesn't, um, it, you know, you, you're lucky if you get to use it. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's useful. Uh, if you can use it, then it's very easy. It's kind of like a, a useless a CNCV gadget. Like, you know, this thing might be very useful to core a pineapple, but it won't do anything else. It's just like, it's a thing that's, I mean, unless unless this item is actually crap, but assuming this thing works, uh, it's good for a pineapple and for not much else. But it's great for a pineapple, just like Eisenstein's criterion. It's just good for polynomials that happen to have a prime device dividing everything except for the last coefficient, and then not good for anything else. Uh, the good thing about Eisenstein's criterion is that it's free and it doesn't take space in your kitchen. So, well, I wouldn't buy the pineapple core, I buy Eisenstein's criterion. Uh, okay, last application. I should rewrite it again. So, um, okay, let's try it. But the, the question I'm going to ask uh, is can you use it to construct or use it with polynomials?
if p divides a naught a1 p doesn't divide a n p squared doesn't divide a naught f is irreducible so now there's a question that you can answer um is there an irreducible polynomial? Yeah. What's the last a? It p divides a naught, and then. Oh. Uh, oh, I don't even know. It was a n minus one. Oh, okay. A n minus one. A n. Thank you. Um. Is there an irreducible polynomial over? Feel free to ask me if you know if you can't read what I write. Like I know my handwriting is not great, but also sometimes it looks different on the screen as it does in the tablet, which is doubly great. So. Is there an irreducible polynomial over Z of the degree 35 or 103 or basically any any given any given degree that I can think of? So well the answer is yes, um, which doesn't um, I mean there's no reason a priori to think there would be, for example. Over, over the reals, there's no irreducible polynomials of degree three because cubic uh, polynomials always have roots. Um, but over Z, there are polynomials which are irreducible of any degree. So can any of you give me an example of an irreducible polynomial of degree 35? X to the 35 minus three. For example, that one works, yeah. Um, did you get a bonus point yet? Uh, no, no you, you got one, all right. Um, okay, so that's an example. Um, and I know it works because three divides all the coefficients except the leading one but nine does not divide three. So we apply Eisenstein's criterion and we're done. If you want one of degree 103, well, nothing special about 35 there. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so that's um, all I can think of doing with Eisenstein criterion. Uh, let's now prove it now that we know what we want it for. So um, the proof, um, the proof is um, is kind of what you would think of doing. Um, you're gonna write it as a product of two polynomials and see what happens. So. Of course, to prove that something is irreducible, I'm going to have to work by contradiction. Uh, assume that assume that it's reducible, and then I'm going to have to show that one of the um, one of the polynomials is a constant. So the first thing is that by Gauss's lemma, this means that it reduces over C. If it reduces over Q, it will reduce over, over Z. So F of X is gonna be the product of two polynomials um, with integer coefficients. All the numbers are integers and 
of course, if I'm writing it this way, uh, the leading terms should be non-zero. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm gonna do is just equate the coefficients. Not x, well, no, x not is not, it's nothing, uh, c not. My bad. Okay, um, so so let's look at constant coefficients. So on the left hand side, it's a naught. What is what is the constant coefficient of the right hand side? Say it again. Uh, the coefficient br times cs after you multiply. Br times cs. Um, that's the the leading coefficients. Uh, if I multiply br oh, times the constant, cs, the constant. I'm sorry. Right. So what's the constant? B zero times c zero. B zero times c zero. Thanks, thanks, John. Yes. Um. Okay. So now, I know that P divides A naught by, well, my, my hypothesis here. What I know about A naught is that it's a multiple of P, but it's not a multiple of P squared. So you have a number that has a prime in its factorization just once and you split it as a product of two numbers. So what do I know about B naught and C naught? Uh, can they both be multiples of P? Can neither be multiples of P? Can only one be a multiple of P? One of them can, but not both at the same time. Exactly. All right, John gets a bonus points. Uh, right, if there's if there's only one P in the factorization of the left, there can only be one on the on the right. So there's only one P on the right hand side, I guess. RHS means right hand side. Um, so P divides B naught or C naught, but not both. Okay, so, um, so. Which does it divide? Uh, well, who cares? Because there's nothing special about the V's or the C's. Um, the, I mean, we could just, if, it, if we wanna say it's the C's, we can always relabel them. So actually, let me see. Um, I'm, just, I'm just gonna choose the one that the book uses. Um, so P divides C naught and P doesn't divide B naught. If it's the other way, uh, switch the names and then keep going. Okay, so, um, so that's what we know. Uh, now I have to turn the page. Um, so let me just, Copy the information again on the next slide. So P divides um, all the coefficients except for the first. Uh, 
and said that p divides c not p doesn't divide p not. Okay, so that's where we are. So what I'm going to do now is look at look at the c's, and I'm going to say, well, the c not is is a multiple of p. Um, I could ask is c one a multiple of p? Keep going. Eventually, they can't all be multiples of p. Um, Why, why can't it? What would happen if this polynomial was a multiple of, of P? It would also divide the leading coefficient. Right, it would divide. Um, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Mason. Uh, he would divide uh, a n, it would divide f. But it doesn't divide f because it doesn't divide the leading coefficients. So I have this list and it starts with a multiple of P, but they can't all be multiples of P. So eventually it stops. It might be the first step. Um, so say C of CM is the smallest, the smallest M for which P does not divide CM. Right? If I, I mean, I know CM is not zero because C, C naught is a multiple of P. And eventually I'm going to reach one, one of these coefficients, take the first time you reach it. Uh, so then um, look at, so So now we're going to look at the coefficients again. So the coefficients in in this equation. So uh, we know we have a formula for what happens when you multiply two polynomials. So let's look at a m. So um, so how do you get x to the m as a product of two polynomials? You get it when you multiply x to the zero times, oh, I keep closing the app. Um, um, you get it when you multiply something of the re zero times something of the re m, multiply one by m minus one. Anytime, anytime the two degrees add up to m, you get x to the m in the multiplication. Okay, so, so this is what we have. And now what we should do is look at what, um, what is a multiple of P. So I have a sum and I wanna ask you now, which of these are multiples of P? So out of these terms in the sum, which of, the, which of them can you tell me that it's a multiple of P or that it isn't? Would it have to be all P's for it to be reducible? It would, I don't know why it would have to be all of them. Oh, B0. B0. B0 is, I said, is not a multiple of P. So what happens when I multiply B0 by CM? It's not a multiple. It's not a multiple of P because 
neither is a multiple of p. I said, I said that p does not divide one, and I said p does not divide the other. You multiply two non-multiples of p, you don't get a multiple of p. Uh, we're, we're using very, very strongly that p is a prime here, because you can multiply two numbers that are now multiples of four and get a multiple of four, but not for a prime. So what about the rest? What do I know about C not? Uh, C naught is a multiple of P, so C naught times BM would be a multiple of P. All right. What about what about C one? C one a multiple of P? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so all of these. All of these are multiples of p because I'm saying p divides c not c one all the way up to c m except for c m. Um, all right, I'll, I'll just get the bonus point as well. Um, okay, so I have a sum of a bunch of multiples of p and then something that is not a multiple of p. Uh, which multiple of p? Uh, b1 cm minus 1 all the way to bm c naught to a non multiple of p. Which is b naught cm. So what happens so when you add a multiple to a non multiple? Well, if you think if you think of taking modulo p, a multiple is zero, and a non-multiple is not zero. So you add zero to something non-zero, uh, you get non-zero. It has whatever remainder when you divide by p as p not c m does. So B does not divide AM. And what does this mean? Uh, well, I know that means th there's only one coefficient that is not a multiple of B. It's the biggest one. So, so now I'm pretty much done. This means that the degree, the degree of All of this thing. Well, he has he has a term. Uh, he has a term in x to the m, x to the n. So, the degree of f. Well, uh, how can the degree of the factor be? at least as big as the degree of the polynomial. Well, they have to be the same. And this has to be a constant. So summing up, I wrote the polynomial as a product of two things. But I showed that one of them has to have degree equal to n uh, because, because I showed, well, I showed that this number has to be, this coefficient has to be the first one, the has to be the nth one. So if I start with something of degree five, I show that any factor has to have at least degree five, then that means it's reducible. And that's Tyson's science criterion. Any questions?
All right. I guess there's no questions. Um, all right. Well, that's it. Uh, we're moving on now um, to the section that in the book is titled Ideals over the polynomial ring. So now we're back to saying, say, looking at polynomials over a field. Um, a is a field. Um, <clears throat> so we've already seen Uh, this I'm not going to prove because I've already done it. Every ideal is principle. Uh, which means It means that it's generated by one element. So for every ideal in the polynomial ring, there is a polynomial that generates the ideal, which means that the ideal is just a set of multiples of of the generator. <clears throat> so you can have two, two polynomials generate the same ideal for if they're, um, if they're multiples of each other, basically. If you have a polynomial and then you multiply it by negative one, that's gonna generate the same ideal. But in a way, ideals are just like polynomials. Um, in that basically to every ideal corresponds one polynomial up to up to multiplication by a constant. Okay, so our goal is to see which ideals are prime and which are maximal. Um, Okay, so um, so what is a what is a prime ideal? This is supposedly from from last semester. What was the definition of a prime ideal? Anyone remember? Mason? Um, if two elements are in the, uh, are in a ring such that their product is in the ideal, then e one of the elements has to be in the ideal. Exactly, yeah. So this should remind you, I think of two things. One of One thing is, if you if you multiply two numbers, this this is something we've just done. You multiply two numbers, and it's a multiple of a prime. One of those numbers has to be a multiple of a prime. If you multiply two numbers, and the result is even, one of the numbers is even. But if the number, if I'm looking at not a prime number, that's not true. I can have two two numbers whose product is a multiple of six, but the numbers could just be two and three, um, neither of which is a multiple of six should also remind you of the fact that in an integral domain, if the product of two things is zero, one of them has to be zero. Um, and I hope you saw last semester that this is the same as saying that R mod I is an integral domain, i.e. 
eight times v, if I look at the classes, the, the product being zero means that one of them is zero. Because being zero in the quotient is the same as the representative being in the ideal. Uh, okay, so that's a prime ideal. So the question, of course, is going to be which of these ideals is prime and what is the maximal ideal? Uh, just tell me so I can write it. It's any ideal for which there exists no other ideal that uh, it's a subset of. Right, exactly. Uh, maximal, so maximal ideal means that it's maximal for the inclusion. Thank you, Mason. If it's not contained in any ideal other than R, and also it can't be uh, R. The, the total ideal, the unit ideal, um, we also call it because it's the ideal one generates, is, is not maximal. That's just the convention that everyone follows. Um, uh, the unit ideal, the, the, the ideal R is an ideal we almost never ever care about. Um, because the quotient is a zero ring and we never care about the zero ring. It's just like the empty set. Um, in, in, in the, it's, it's exactly like the empty set in how much I care about it, which is I'm sure it's there, but I never want to think about it. <clears throat> um, and either way, if we thought about it, no ideals would be maximal except for itself. So, so the stuff just, below it just containing it is 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 where the interesting things are happening um and if you recall this is the same as saying that the quotient is a field the reason for this maybe if you don't remember you should look back at look at the book at chapter 16 is that the ideals of R mod I are the ideals that contain I. And I just said there's none of those except for I. Um, <clears throat> so the quotient has two ideals and a, a ring that has two ideals is zero and everything is a field and conversely. And now since every field is an integral domain, every, every maximal ideal is prime. Okay, uh, what can I do in five minutes? <clears throat> okay, let's start figuring out which ideals are maximal and which are prime. Um, so, since they are principal, um, they are of the form, they're generated by something. Okay, so what I'm going to prove now is that is what, what happens when they're contained in each other. So they're contained if and only if G divides F. I can prove this. Um, this is this proof is just following the definitions. So um, going forward, so if the ideal F generates is contained in the ideal G generates. So um, 
what is an element? Um, so if this happens, if the if this ideal is containing the ideal generated by G, what element is contained in the ideal generated by G for sure? F, right. Um, something that is definitely in the ideal generated by F is F itself. <clears throat> so, um, so now I'm going to apply the definition. So what is the definition in words? What is the ideal generated by G? Which, which are the polynomials that are in this ideal? G of X multiplied by all the other elements. So, exactly. Uh, so the set of multiples of that, of that, of G. This is the same, this is the same as saying G times H for every H, right? Uh, so if F is in the set of multiples of G, that means that F is a multiple of G. And that's it. That's that's what I'm trying to prove. Uh, any questions? So going back, this is also going to be just the the definition. If f is a multiple of g. What can I say then? This is just going to be the same proof going back. Um, I'm going to, this is so silly. I'm just going to answer myself. Uh, if f is a multiple of g, f of x is in the set of multiples of g. The set And the set of multiples of g by definition, is the ideal generated by x. So now, if, a, if an element is in an ideal, uh, now, by the properties of an ideal, someone left, OK. What uh, what can we ensure? Ideals are closed under sums, under multiplication by anything. They contain zero under opposites. Which property am I supposed to use here? Closed under multiplication. Right. So if it's um, if it's closed under multiplication by anything, that means that any multiple of f is also in in this ideal. And in a formula that's saying that the multiples of f are contained in the multiples of g. I mean, and without properties of ideals, just directly, if f is a multiple of g, any multiple of f is, is one as well. This is the ideal generated by f. This is the ideal generated by g. And now I'm done. <clears throat> exactly on time. OK. Um, so.